There's a reason Nicolas Cage is such a memeable member of Hollywood. He's pretty hilarious, often unintentionally so. Sometimes it totally works for him. I said, put the bunny back in the box. In the 2006 remake of The Wicker Man, though, the joke was only on him. In the film, he played an ill-fated detective who's generously trekked out to parts unknown to look for his ex fiancees daughter. What he ends up encountering is a cult of man-murdering witches who make it a game to let him feel like he's just heroically rescued the girl, only to have her return him right into their clutches so they can sacrifice him to their bee-making mother spirit. In the process of his tortuous demise, the sisters enclose him in a mask of bees. His flailing, screaming reaction is monumentally funny, given the gravity of the situation. What, what is that? What is that? What is it? Oh, no, not the bees! Not the bees! Ah! The film now enjoys a cult notoriety owed to Cage's performance, which here is an outright classic example of overacting. Of all the people who have portrayed Batman's most iconic nemesis, Jared Leto was the weirdest and believed by many to be the least successful. The Joker is, at his simplest, a manifestation of chaos in the way humanity would go if people gave up on the idea of being good to one another. He's not someone whose ultimate goal is personal wealth or sexual satisfaction, yet that's how Leto played him. A garish, smarmy mobster who spent a little too much time curating his Instagram feed. In the Suicide Squad scene where he and Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn are standing over multiple vats of acid at Ace Chemicals, Leto's Joker is overmannered and creepy enough to make a viewer's skin crawl, but not in the brilliantly unsettling way Heath Ledger did in The Dark Knight. Anyone watching him in the scene might very well feel the need to jump into the screen to keep Robbie from being exposed to such a weird, repulsive speech about living and dying. Would you die for me? Yes, the Joker is supposed to be scary and uncanny, but in regards to Harley Quinn, he also needs to be believably charismatic. Leto utterly fails in this regard. Bonnie Wright and Daniel Radcliffe have little to no chemistry through much of the Harry Potter film series. Despite the fact that Ginny and Harry have a sweet, banter-filled development as a couple in the books, it's not a central focus of the story. It's not a central focus of the story in the movies either, but their relationship still serves an important purpose, and it's one simply not supported by what is seen on screen. For example, what happens in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince? In this scene, Ginny helps Harry dispose of the Half-Blood Prince's potions textbook in the Room of Requirement. It's a scene made exclusively for the movie, and it's painfully obvious the writers were trying to wrap up a loose end while developing Ginny and Harry's relationship in the same scene. Unfortunately, it's one of only two scenes where Ginny and Harry are alone in the entirety of the film, and their chemistry is not sufficient enough to be conveyed in just a few scenes. Wright was cast as Ginny when she was just a little kid, so few could have predicted that she wouldn't be up to task of carrying a key element of Harry's eventual story. She recites her lines like a high schooler reading aloud in English class, frankly, and it's really difficult to understand why Harry would be interested in her at all. I can stay hidden up here too if you like. <laughs> The Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy never needed to be a peak artistic screen adaptation of its source material. This makes sense, because the source material is essentially just alternate universe Twilight fanfiction that misrepresents the nature of sexual BDSM relationships. Arguably, the only thing the movie did need to do was provide the viewer with steamy love scenes where the chemistry between its two romantic leads sparked like a live wire. Unfortunately, as in this scene, Fifty Shades of Grey the movie failed to deliver on that front. Dakota Johnson and Jamie Dornan, who were rumored to dislike each other throughout the filming of the trilogy, though Johnson has since debunked those rumors, had absolutely no sexual chemistry. In all of the scenes of what should be two people realizing their sexual compatibility, everything feels awkward and forced. At one point, Dornan's Christian lays Johnson's Anastasia face down on a table, and it looks like an SNL spoof of a sex scene thanks to the actor's awkward footwork and relatively blank expressions. They're uncomfortable to watch together, and neither of them is a good enough actor to make up for their lack of chemistry. Johnson doesn't know who her character is supposed to be, and it shows, while Dornan's American accent is far more off-putting than sexually commanding. There are a lot of bad acting and memeable moments in the Harry Potter film, but one of the most fan-scrutinized takes place in the fourth movie, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. In the film, the magical Goblet of Fire spits out Harry's name for participation in a brutal student contest known as the Triwizard Tournament. Dumbledore needs to make sure Harry isn't responsible for this turn of events. Harry, you put your name in the Goblet of Fire. No, sir. 
It's alarming, aggressive, and completely at odds with how the scene is described in Chapter 17 of the book upon which the movie was based, in which J.K. Rowling wrote that Dumbledore asked calmly if Harry put his own name in the goblet. This over-the-top scene very well could be a case of bad acting notes from director Mike Newell, but in fairness, he may have been distracted by his cracked ribs at the time. Given that Michael Gambon's performances as Dumbledore are otherwise consistent across all the movies in which he appeared, having replaced Richard Harris, who died after filming Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets, and several different directors, it's an outlier. Where to begin with cats? Every scene is so badly acted, badly motion captured, and badly conceived on every imaginable level that it seems unlikely anyone who's ever seen it will ever forget it. The 2019 adaptation of Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber's long-running musical somehow managed to drag in stars as venerable as Judi Dench, Ian McKellen, Taylor Swift, and Jennifer Hudson to prance around in digital fur. Few of them get away with their dignity intact, and few of them have more to lose than Idris Elba. The British star defined gangster cool for a generation as Stringer Bell on The Wire, landed scene-stealing roles in blockbuster franchises from Thor to Suicide Squad to Fast and Furious to Star Trek and became the internet's number one choice for the next James Bond. We can only imagine those online petitions lost a whole lot of signatures after Elba appeared as McCavity, the magically powered villain of the piece. Elba's signature stoic cool has deserted him all through the movie, not helped at all by an unsettling character design that leaves him frequently bare naked in flesh-colored fur. He sounds less like the stoic tough guys Elba made his name playing or the menacing master criminal he's supposed to be and more like a chipper birthday clown. Okay, yes, the January Jones character in X-Men First Class is named Emma Frost. She's not supposed to be a particularly warm and emotive person, but she's also not supposed to speak in a monotone voice with all the energy of a 7th grade substitute teacher. January Jones once did great work on Mad Men as Betty Draper, but Betty's complete repression of personality and desire shouldn't be applied to a character like Emma Frost. She's meant to be sharp and sexual, occasionally bored, sure, but never vacant. In this particular scene, Frost is confronted by Magneto and Professor X about Sebastian Shaw's whereabouts. They might as well be asking her for directions to the nearest bathroom. If there's anything that would get Emma Frost excited, it's a confrontation with two of the most powerful mutants. She should be angling for every second of this interaction, but instead, Jones relies on her physical beauty to do all the heavy lifting. She might look the part, but her performance doesn't do justice to the popular comic book character. You can stop trying to read my mind, sugar. 2016's super anti-hero flick Suicide Squad was popular enough to rate a sequel of sorts, with The Suicide Squad, but word of mouth was so overwhelmingly negative that, as the name implies, James Gunn's sequel was as much a fresh start as a follow-up. And if you want to know why, look no further than the introduction of Katana, the token superhero in this motley crew of supervillains. A big part of this movie's notorious reputation is the uneven pacing. The plot can't even get started until it's already half over, since the first half gets eaten up with extended introductions for each character in the large cast. Well, most of them. Poor Katana ends up having the same amount of information crammed into a couple of seconds, and Joel Kinnaman as squad leader Rick Flagg rattles it off like he's got 10 minutes left before tea time. This is Katana. She's got my back. She can cut all you in half with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. Or, with his stop-start delivery, maybe it sounds more like he's making it up as he goes along, slowing down as if he's thinking of what to say next, then suddenly speeding through the rest of the delivery. This is not the first time Jack and Jill has been included on a list of movies that failed, and it likely won't be the last. Even before the movie came out, people were skeptical that the Adam Sandler vehicle, in which he played both Jack and dressed in drag to play Jack's twin sister Jill, would be worth watching, and has since earned distinction as perhaps the worst of Sandler's worst movies. The entire thing is a train wreck, but the Thanksgiving dinner scene is a good showcase of how poorly Sandler handles both of the film's titular roles. It's not unreasonable that Jack is disgusted by Jill when it is revealed that she's been touching him somewhat inappropriately, or trying to, for a lot of their lives. But Sandler plays the disgust not like someone with a complicated and traumatic relationship with the sibling, but rather like a man repulsed by the vision of himself in a wig and fake boobs. As Jill, Sandler is ridiculous. There is almost nothing feminine about his portrayal, to the point where it's no longer a cheap joke about an ugly woman, but rather just terrible acting. The movie is horribly written, but Sandler's performance is one of its worst elements. 
Mickey Rooney's role in the 1961 Audrey Hepburn classic Breakfast at Tiffany's is frequently cited as one of Hollywood's most upsetting, racist screen depictions, and that's really saying something. Rooney plays Mr. Yuniyoshi, Holly Golightly's grumpy, grating landlord who is perpetually put out by his tenant's careless attitude. The most shocking thing about the role, by far, is that it is a racist, condescending example of yellowface, a term used to refer to ethnically Asian on-screen characters being played by white actors. Rooney's portrayal is an unfunny caricature of a caricature and the fact that it's a bad performance seems like the least of its faults. Watching Rooney stumble around his apartment throughout the beginning of the scene is cringe-inducing. His clumsiness is laughably unconvincing, and his frustration with Holly for buzzing him after once again forgetting her key to get in the building is over the top and feels like a scene from a stage musical. Today, Tiffany's is held up as a classic. Nonetheless, Rooney's performance is a stain on both the film and Rooney's lengthy career. One of the true classics of modern so bad it's goodness, Birdemic Shock and Terror, built most of its cults on the back of its hilariously unconvincing killer birds. And they're quite the sight, embarrassingly low quality computer creations hanging in space as their wingtips wiggle and they squawk monotonously. But there's no shortage of bad human acting here. Despite the imminent threat of bird murder, the stars of Birdemic don't do much but take a leisurely drive down the California coast giving them the opportunity to meet a whole menagerie of awful performances. We've got to give the gold to Steven Gustafsson, as a forest-dwelling hermit in a legendary bad wig who rants about bark beetles and other environmental bugaboos. But the episodic plot has to keep moving, and you can hear the gears grinding as writer-director James Wynn hastily writes the hermit out of the script. I hear a mountain lion. I gotta get back to my house. You better get to your car. It was very nice meeting you. That's ridiculous enough, but it's Gustafsson's performance that sells it. With his wobbly voice and a tone that sounds like he's just about fed up with these obnoxious guests and wants to make up any excuse to shoo them out of his woods. There's no shortage of bad performances in Lost in Space. There's the staggering miscalculation of casting friend star Matt LeBlanc as a badass space marine. There's future Mean Girl star Lacey Chabert putting on an ear-piercingly high nasal voice that's somehow more cartoony than her role as an actual cartoon character in The Wild Thornberries. And then there's William Hurt, who cannot sound less invested. For an emotionally charged scene that calls for him to say goodbye to his wife before leaving to explore an uncharted planet, possibly never to return, he sounds more robotic than the actual robot who plays a major role. It doesn't help any that he doesn't even call her by name, adding to the impression that he really is a robot reading out lines of code. I love you, wife. That perfect storm of bad writing and bad acting has caught the public imagination enough to resurface on the internet from time to time. But it's worth watching Lost in Space, all the way through to confirm that, yes, Hurt's whole performance is like that. It was pretty surprising when Variety announced that Ashton Kutcher would be stepping in to play Steve Jobs in an independently produced biopic centering on the tech titan who had passed away the year prior, in 2011. Up until that point, Kutcher was best known for comedic work on shows like That 70s Show and fronting the celebrity prank show Punked. His bona fides weren't exactly the kind usually associated with a prestige biopic about a troubled, real-life figure, but it wouldn't be the first time a left-field casting choice worked out. Unfortunately, Kutcher's performance in Jobs wasn't good enough to compensate for a script with terrible pacing and a proclivity towards juvenile comedy. Watching Kutcher try to play Jobs' uncharming volatility in a scene where he gets into a fight over his vision is like watching a Harlem Globetrotter attempt to jockey in the Kentucky Derby. Throughout the scene, Kutcher seems like he's mere seconds away from breaking into laughter. There are other parts of the movie where he plays Jobs with more effective nuance, but this scene almost feels like an SNL impression. I already fired you! His dramatic performance in a more recent movie, Vengeance, was much better because it left him room to lean into his own brand of charisma, one in complete opposition to that of the real Steve Jobs. Kutcher's charisma is inherent and whimsical, while Jobs was notoriously begrudging and intimidating. Financially speaking, there's perhaps no actor whose career got off to a better start than Orlando Bloom. Between 2001 and 2005, he released three Lord of the Rings films, the same number of Pirates of the Caribbean films, and also appeared in the blockbuster Black Hawk Down, all grossing well over $100 million domestically, all making a cultural impact. Bloom then made the seemingly no-brainer decision to work with Say Anything, Jerry Maguire, almost famous maestro Cameron Crowe on a dramedy called Elizabethtown. Everything went downhill from there. His performance in the movie isn't all bad, but in this particular scene with Kirsten Dunst, 
He sounds like someone who just recently learned English attempting to play a native English speaker. This is particularly sad because he is a native English speaker. He just has a British accent instead of a generic West Coast American one. It's like he doesn't know how to use contractions or stress the correct syllables in many of the words he's using. And it's easy to imagine that Dunce's confused look is more because of that than Bloom's character being so charming. What I am saying is good. Before Timothy Chalamet and Denis Villeneuve decided to resurrect Dune, sci-fi author Frank Herbert's magnum opus, there was the David Lynch dud that came out in 1984 and co-starred Sting, the singer from the band The Police. Unsurprisingly, Sting didn't do too much more acting following his role as Fade Rotha Harkonnen, most likely because it's pretty difficult to take him seriously as a dangerous threat to Paul or any other characters in the film. Fade is supposed to be an extraordinary warrior, perhaps the greatest alive, as well as cutthroat and particularly obsessed with eviscerating Paul Atreides. Sting goes very over the top in the scene leading up to his character's death, wherein Fade and Paul duel over the fate of Arrakis. I will kill him! Fade is supposed to provide a destructively expressive counterpoint to Paul's composure and resignation in the scene. Not supposed to be funny. There are times when Sting himself seems to be unable to keep the corners of his mouth from turning up as he throws a tantrum. And tantrum is the word for it. Despite the fact that Fade is supposed to be intensely terrifying, there should be some suspense as to whether Paul is going to win the duel, and because that can't come from the plot, since the central protagonist in a saga like Dune doesn't usually die in a knife fight. It has to come from a believably vicious fade. Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka in the 1971 classic Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory became iconic. Johnny Depp didn't stand much of a chance in succeeding with his take on the same character in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, regardless of the actual quality of his performance. But he made a lot of very strange acting choices panned by critics and audiences alike. It's possible he was trying to distinguish himself from Wilder, but there must be ways to do that outside of seeing how much you can disturb an audience before people start walking out. In this scene, Wonka is bringing his golden ticket contest winners into the factory and becomes immediately wildly uneasy by the presence of multiple children. Reminder, Wonka is a chocolate maker. Yes, he's supposed to be somewhat unfeeling towards the kids, but he's not supposed to forget how to function in front of them. Oh, I don't care. Depp plays Wonka like someone who has lived their entire life in silence in a cardboard box and only emerged the prior Tuesday. A fair amount of this is informed by Tim Burton's bizarre script, but Depp's acting doesn't help. Cameron Diaz was miscast in Gangs of New York. For one thing, she simply does not look like a young Irish immigrant from a Civil War era New York City. Between her tan complexion and her unconvincing red-haired wig, she has a look fit for modern movies. More to the point, the biggest reason Diaz was miscast as Jenny is because she just couldn't do the part justice in such a dramatic prestige picture. In this scene, opposite Leonardo DiCaprio, Diaz isn't able to convey Jenny's ferocity as a poor young woman attempting to make her way in a world stacked against her. DiCaprio and Diaz don't have very much on-screen chemistry, and their characters suffer for it. Diaz fails to make Jenny convincing as a worthy adversary for DiCaprio's Amsterdam. She fails to convey anything other than the rote, half-heartedly antagonistic sass of a romantic lead in a rom-com about rivals who become lovers. I don't know which one's yours. Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 is only barely a movie. About half of it is just recycled from the original Deadly Night, as narrated by a character who didn't actually witness any of it. So how did it become such an evergreen cult classic? Two words, Eric Freeman. Freeman's performance as Ricky, the younger brother of the original Santa Claus costume killer, is exquisitely awful. Even the recycled footage is worth sitting through just to hear him narrate over, sinking his teeth into every word and dropping a sarcastic sneer in random places. And that's before he goes on a rampage of his own, cackling at his own apparently self-reloading gun. The writers weren't up to the task of coming up with the snappy quip slasher fans demand, and when Ricky takes aim at some poor schlub taking his trash out, they can't think of anything better for him to say. Garbage day! Fortunately, Freeman makes the most of it, eye-popping and eyebrow-waggling his way to online memedom. It doesn't help that every other aspect of this scene is just as hysterically terrible with the editor cutting the scene to shreds so we get an almost subliminal shot of the bullet going through the victim's back and then disappearing when we cut to a different angle. 